The title um, is, and it's not always easy for me to remember, the title is uh, To Speak Light Pours Out, which is a shortening of a longer piece of line of poetry, which is uh, as they open their mouths to speak, light pours out. So I, this for me fits with this idea of the channeling of ideas, the channeling of voices, the, um, and actually there's a, uh, one of the poems that we use from Rebecca Tamas in the piece is another version. Um, she pushed her fingers into the mud and she listened as hard as she could to what the mud was saying until sometimes the mud came up her throat and out of her mouth. So there's this idea that words also are visceral, maybe they're mud, maybe they're light, maybe they're... And also this idea that bodies can produce um, ideas and words, and that also those, another key phrase is words that make worlds, which is an idea coming from Donna Haraway, that by, by channeling words and by creating, uh, one starts to shift the world and to make the world, actually. So I wanted to focus on this act of... of um, what comes out of us when we speak and what effect it has in the world. So this is how the title uh, came to be. They did some research on um, listening and they found out that um, people's heartbeats, like in a room where people are listening together, people's heartbeats often uh, synchronize, but their breathing always stays polyrhythmic. So this was, yes, yeah, so around this idea of gathering people in a room to listen and to be aware of many different perspectives that are in the room. And so there's, there is a kind of unity that comes with listening together, and yet everyone remains in their own rhythm as well. So that I really enjoy this image of, of being unified but polyrhythmic at the same time. I don't know if it's true. I'm not gonna um, put a heart rate monitor on all of the audience, but um, the research apparently points in this direction. Yeah, so I thought about uh, what could be uh, how I wanted to gather people in the audience or what the invitation would be to be in a theatre. And I liked this um, co-listening, like a listening space together, which is something I worked on also in previous pieces. <clears throat> but I, for the first time ever, started working with drums and with percussion. This mixed with voices, text, vocality. Um, I got very interested in rhythm and percussion uh, simply because it is so physical as a listener as well. I think it has a very strong physical effect as a listener. And I'm always very interested in how the bodies of the audience are together in the space. And this is one of the ways to um, really literally vibrate um, physically uh, everybody. Um, and I especially got interested in uh, polyrhythm because uh, Let's say it's a it's a complex kind of musicality, but it's also very uh, politically interesting to think about because it, it's different um, rhythms that sit on top of each other and that don't that have completely different um, treatments of time, and therefore are kind of different worlds actually that that sit on top of each other. And a listener, it's very comp as a listener, it's very complex and sort of confusing but exciting to listen to polyrhythms because you you understand that you're not listening to something that's um, normalized into, into one coherency. And therefore you're very active because you find yourself catching different parts of the rhythm and following in them and then getting distracted and, and so on. And it's like having many voices talk at once uh, about different things. And so there's many people that have written about this, like again, on a political, social level, like what this can represent. Um, but it's also very experiential as a listener. And as a player, it's very hard to play. <laughs> None of the performers are um, professional drummers. Uh, only one of them has any experience from before. So we really were doing what we didn't know how to do. So we've been training very hard to um, become players uh, as well. Um, so yeah, the musicality is a big, big part of this listening that we do uh, together. And then on top of that, there are the voices and the texts that come with it as well. We looked at a lot of um, manifestos from different trans feminist uh, origins and a lot of uh, writing and theory about um, different forms of human interconnectivity, basically uh, looking at intersectionality and uh, on quite a theoretical level, but also really looking on a um, sociological level, like how it is that people form human identities, how they can 
realize their own flexibility inside their identity, both really inside themselves, but also as a community. Um, so we were really looking at some of the tendencies, some of the social political tendencies to really form a very narrow view of normal and then how um, violent this is and that how important it is, in my opinion at least, to understand the complexity that goes beyond uh, what I would call sterile versions of normal, and the um, the huge like the huge complexity within a person, but also within communities of people. So, there the theory on intersectionality was in, was very important. Um, but like I say, a lot of trans feminist texts that are really thinking much more into ecology, also and across many borders of theory, and trying to bring a lot of ideas together. So we looked a lot at theory, but we also looked a lot at poetry, um, because I. I'm very interested to understand what are uh, positive narratives and positive imagery towards perhaps a future that um, is released from some of the binaries, tensions, violences, oppressions of today, and to think about ways to put imagery towards a, a different kind of reality which is coming um, and on its way. And in this piece, I, I want we wanted to work on the energy of what comes, what is what is coming, and what it will be um, leaving behind um, the violence this, that are in action today. Um, and yeah, and this I found that uh, yeah, poetry was a very good place to start to look for this kind of um, language imagery. Mm.